Okay, welcome to the playlist for the solutions to the end of chapter problems in the textbook uh, Introduction to Statistical Rethinking. Uh, in the description, uh, there'll be a link where you can download the book, um, which you really should do, uh, as well as to a series of lectures given by the authors of that textbook, and, and their, their lectures are very, very good, uh, so you should watch those. Um, you'll also get a link to the collab sheet here, uh, as well as my GitHub um, for anybody that wants to kind of play with the code themselves. Although these questions, uh, these first part of the questions are conceptual, so there is no code here, but uh, we'll, we'll do it in collab nonetheless. Okay, <clears throat> so the first question, uh, assuming that you've read chapters one and two, um, uh, says that, uh, or, or, or wants us to consider different scenarios, A through D here, and to predict whether a, uh, whether a high flexibility or low flexibility model will do better uh, with, with that data, okay? So what I just said may not make any sense if you haven't looked at the chapter, haven't watched the, uh, the lectures. Um, so hopefully you do that, but I'm gonna try to give enough background here to uh, hopefully kind of get you through the through my answers. Okay, so in the textbook in section 2.2.2 we learn about the bias variance trade-off and roughly what this is describing is the following. When we make a model, the estimates of that model, so maybe think predictions, maybe make a model to predict something, will be wrong uh, somewhat, okay? Maybe a lot, maybe a little, but it's always, it's not going to be perfect typically. Um, and the source of those errors can be uh, attributed to one of three sources, either to bias or variance, hence the bias-variance trade-off, or irreducible error. And so what are these? So bias is a systematic deviation away from reality. So the model is predicting things, and it's always wrong in the same way. Okay? Variance... I think about as being the fickleness of a model's estimates. So what does this mean? Um, so the error due to variance in the model is, um, is uh, so say that you collect, uh, a da you, you collect data and you train your model on that data, and so the predictions that that model makes are going to be largely contingent on the data that you fed into it. And of course, if you give a different data set, if you train on a different data set, its predictions are going to be different, okay? And if it's, the, the magnitude of that difference uh, of predictions from data set to data set on the same model is the variance, okay? And, uh, and so the bias-variance trade-off arises because of the following. Bias tends to occur when the model, uh, well, when the data and relationships in the data are more complicated than what the model can can use or, or than, the, than the model can detect, okay? And so the way that we decrease bias is to increase flexibility of the model. And flexibility is just generally how well it, the model can handle uh, complexity in the data, okay? So if we want to reduce bias, we need to increase the flexibility, all right? And we can kind of see that here in this figure. So bias is these blue lines. So as I go along the x-axis, as I'm, as I'm increasing flexibility or making the model more complicated or, or able to handle more, more complication, we see that bias goes down. Okay, the error due to bias goes down. However, with, with variance, variance increases uh, as, or well, tends to increase uh, as flexibility uh, increases. Okay, so again we see, uh, so here's variance in the orange on these three models, okay, and as flexibility increases, we are increasing the variance in, in the model, okay, and so what our goal is going to be is to find a model that has just the right amount of complexity, right, where there's not too much variance and not too much bias, okay, and, uh, and we see that represented here with this kind of dark maroon or red curve where the combination of the two sources of error find their minimum. Okay, and so again, we're gonna do that by changing the flexibility of the model. 
Now, what is irreducible error? Well, irreducible error uh, is error that uh, is not attributed to bias or variance, and therefore we can't modulate, we can't make better by changing the flexibility of, of the model. Now, the problem, uh, well, I should say the difficulty, is that <clears throat> when we are finding error in our model, we don't actually know whether it's due to bias or variance or irreducible error. We will see later in the book ways of trying to estimate uh, the contributions from these three sources, but we don't really know, okay? Um, now, luckily, uh, different features of models or of data um, will help us predict how much each of these is contributing. And so we can kind of use a little bit of some heuristics to try to judge where these errors are coming from. Now, the reason that not knowing where the error is coming from is a problem is because, again, if the error is because of too much bias, then we need to increase the flexibility of our model. But we don't, but if it's because of variance, then we need to decrease the flexibility. And if we don't know if the error is because of where the error is coming from, whether bias or variance, well then, we, we could adjust the model in inappropriately and actually make everything worse. Okay, so now I kind of give an example here uh, that I encourage you to read through on the, on the collab sheet. Um, but uh, I'm not going to go through it here just because it's a little bit long. But the gist is this. So say we're building a model to predict a heart attack. Okay. And now heart attack probably is a very complicated thing to try to predict, and there's probably a lot of predictors that we can use, such as age, uh, uh, probably age, sex, medical history, etc. So there's all of these different predictors that we could use to try to predict heart attack. Um, but there are also possible predictors that probably have nothing to do with heart attack. And I think here I use... Uh, the amount of birthday cake consumed on one's seventh birthday, right? We shouldn't expect that to have really any relationship to heart attack. Or at least we should, for the sake of this example, we're just going to stipulate that it has no effect. So ideally, our model will, will have a predictor term or try to predict every one of the, uh, every one of the contributing factors to heart attack, okay? But we we can't actually do that uh, for a lot of different reasons. Um, one is that there's going to be things that predict heart attack that we don't know anything about. Okay? Um, there's also going to be certain factors that do predict heart attacks but very weakly, and so they're just not interesting. Uh, and then there's also sets of predictive factors that when you put them in the model at the same time, now this is beyond the scope of what we're trying to address here, but we'll be talking about it later, uh, as well as in my statistical rethinking uh, uh, playlist. Um, but by adding certain combinations of predictors to the model, uh, you can cause all sorts of confounding. And, um, and all that means is that we are screwing up the model um, for, uh, for, 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 for reasons that just have to do with how these different predictors interact with one another. Okay, so... Now, consider a model trying to predict heart attack where, we're, where we just have age, right? So we have a very simple model, but we know that heart attack is much more complicated, right? And so we should expect our model to be biased because there's all this complexity in predicting heart attack that we're just not capturing with the model, okay? So then this uh, kind of leads us to ask, well, why not just add a term for every conceivable predictor of, uh, of heart attack? Right? This, this should eliminate bias. And the risk that you run there is with every predictor that you're putting into the model, there is a, there, each one of them has a chance of not actually being a good predictor of heart attack at all. But now, but now that's in the model. Okay? Now, that may not be a problem, right? Because if, it has, because if that's not a good predictor, the model should be able to tell you that it's not a good predictor. But let's just say that the data sample that we'll, we'll use birthday cake as an example. Okay, let's say that birthday cake makes its way into the model, and uh, and again we're stipulating that birthday cake does not have any effect on heart attack risk. But let's just say that the sample of data that we have, by mere coincidence, does find a relationship between birthday cake and uh, and heart attack. 
Well, then, that mo then our model is going to say that birthday cake is a good predictor of heart attack. Okay? Now, of course, if we were to have used a different data sa sample, which we don't, we usually have one sample, but if we, were to, uh, if we were to have had a different data sample, then that would not have been, uh, that would not have uh, been shown to be relevant in predicting heart attack. Okay? And so what we've seen here is that in the first model where birthday cake seems to predict, uh, seems to predict heart attack, we have overfit the data since we are, we are inappropriately fitting to just some kind of fake relationship in the data. Okay? And now the difference between the model that found a relationship with birthday cake and the one that did not, okay, this is variance, right? One model predicts that birthday cake is predictive and the other one does not. And that is an error due to variance in the model. Okay, so that's just a little spiel here. So let's go through, uh, let's go through the actual questions. Okay, so the first scenario that we're asked to contemplate is a large sample size with few predictors, okay? And this is my answer, and you can read it if you would like. But large, but, uh, but basically what is being said here is that if you have a lot of data, um, then, you, then you are in a good situation uh, to not need a very flexible model, okay? I didn't say that very well. If you have a lot of data, you are in a good position to be able to capture a lot of the complexity in the data. Now, our model has few predictors, and so it's a fairly inflexible model, and that may be fine, but if there are complexities in the data that you want to capture, then, then this model may have more bias than one that has, uh, that has uh, more predictors, okay? Second, the number of predictors is very large, and the number of observations is very small. So this is the opposite of A. Now, in this example, uh, we would hope that, or we, we should think that an inflexible model is going to do better. Okay, but why? So we have a lot of predictors. Now, every one of these predictors is going to need some amount of information to be able to get a good estimate of. Okay, but when we just have a few observations, there's not a lot of information that can be shared among the many predictors, right? And so, because of this, our estimates with this many predictors is going to be very poor. Okay, so again, for B, we should expect an inflexible model will do better than a flexible model. Okay, now C and D, these are uh, kind of obverses of, of one another. Uh, so the relationship, so we're describing a relationship between the predictors and the response variable as being highly nonlinear. In other words, very complex. Okay, so by complex, uh, we're, I'm being cued off to that by the highly nonlinear relationship. So when we have a, again, when we have a complex relationship between predictors and response, we need, we need more terms in the model, more predictors to be able to predict all of these weird relationships that are causing this nonlinear uh, non uh, relationship. So here, a complex model or, or a flexible model, all else being equal, should do better than an inflexible model. And finally, uh, the variance term is extremely high. Now, what does the, the variance term of the data, uh, what does this correspond to? Well, this actually corresponds to the irreducible error. And I claim that here, a uh, flexible model will tend to do worse than an inflexible model. Okay, but why? So, with a flexible model, one with many predictors, um, the the model will not know that, that, that the error is due to irreducible error. And so it will look for patterns uh, that, that, fit its, uh, that fit its predictors, right? But again, if that error is truly irreducible, then it's not going to be reduced by, uh, it's not going to be reduced by more or less predictors, by more or less flexibility. But the model, again, not knowing that, will will make predictions for these things. And again, if you, uh, if your sample just happens to have a spurious relationship between the, between a predictor and the outcome, your model will, will find that. But th that does not mean that it generalizes to other data sets. In other words, we are overfitting just like we saw in the birthday cake heart attack example. And so we should expect that a flexible model will be, will have more error due to variance. 